Hello everyone and welcome to episode five of our deep intensive study of the great wisdom classic of ancient Chinese Taoism, the Tao Te Ching, here in the Stephen Mitchell translation from HarperCollins. So we've been going through this study quite closely now for four videos. This is our fifth and last episode. Thanks for sticking with us and I really, really appreciate you being here with me. Um, we're, we're gonna pick up right where we left off uh, here with chapter 68. The best athlete wants his opponent at his best. The best general enters the mind of his enemy. The best businessman serves the common good. The best leader follows the will of the people. All of them embody the virtue of non-competition. Not that they don't love to compete, but they do it in the spirit of play. In this, they are like children and in harmony with the Tao. You know, the best athletes really do love it when they get to compete against other athletes who are worthy of their excellence. You want your opponent to do well. I mean, it'd be nice to win, but the best, you know, what fun is it to play against people far below your ability and to enter into that arena in the sense of play, whether it's in the field of business or whatever it is. And there's that sense again of, of loving kindness, of compassion, of, of cooperation, of enjoying the, the to and fro and the tug and the pull and the push and of, of all of these wonderful life forms that we get to share this time and space with. It's great to be alive and to be grateful for that and to enjoy even, even the games that we play as we try to best one another and push each other to our highest levels of excellence. How could we be our best if we were not playfully competing with others who are trying to be their best? This is how the hawk developed her acute vision by trying to chase rabbits. And this is how the rabbit learned to turn on a dime by trying to avoid hawks. The hawk and the rabbit um, pushed each other to their own best, highest potential. That's how Tao got it done. And we ought to recognize that in our own lives as well. Let me jump over to chapter 70. It's a pretty short one. Lao Tzu says in chapter 70, my teachings are easy to understand and easy to put into practice. Yet your intellect will never grasp them. And if you try to practice them, you'll fail. My teachings are older than the world. How can you grasp their meaning? If you want to know me, look inside your own heart. I mean, you know this is where they got Yoda in Star in Star Wars, right? I have not mentioned Star Wars once yet, but I can't contain myself any longer. Any fans of the Star Wars stories, now too many films and sub-stories to count, uh, know that when George Lucas conceived this whole thing back in the, in, the, in the 70s, he was reading a lot of Joseph Campbell and Campbell's classic here with a thousand faces. And he was a student of world religions, including Taoism. And so one has to look no further than the Tao Te Ching to see the influence, the core influence for the religion of the Jedi and specifically the idea of the force, which is clearly Lucas's word for the Tao. It's not a personified entity. It's everywhere all the time. It's the it's the conscious intelligence that animates all reality. And the Jedi warrior then, the Taoist sage, is one who gets her ego out of the way so that she can become a channel or he can become a channel through which the Tao operates. Just like Krishna said in, in the Bhagavad Gita, when you perform the work of your dharma, of your duty, that's not you doing the work anymore. That's Brahman working through you. And the Jedi Master is one who uses the force or lets the force flow through them, not in service of his or her private or egoic cravings or fears, but in service of what is right 
and what is good in service of the force to make myself an instrument through which that moves. And we hear that same perspective here. That's what, that, that's what Lao Tzu is telling us to do. Even if you're just selling insurance or if you're raising a family or you're a landscaper or you're a kidney surgeon, a urologist, or whatever the heck it is you're doing to do it in this way. It's a remarkable portrait. It really, really is. Chapter 71. Not knowing is true knowledge. Presuming to know is a disease. First realize that you are sick. Then you can move toward health. The master is her own physician. She has healed herself of all knowing. <laughs> Thus she is truly whole. Now he's playing with, the, with, with equivocation here, with words having more than one meaning, and he's switching them. And the word knowing here sounds like a bad thing. You know, not knowing is true knowledge. Again, he's talking about the mindless accumulation of data, of information, without any real rich wisdom or understanding. You know, wisdom versus knowledge. I'm reminded of the great uh, story that Plato tells in his dialogue, the Credo, the Phaedo, and the Apology, the death of, so of Socrates. You know, those last months of Socrates' life, and Socrates gets put on trial, and, and basically he ends up telling the jury, you know, I went looking for, for people wiser than myself and I couldn't find any. Uh, they thought they were wiser than anybody else, but they weren't. And, and Socrates tells the jury, look, the only advantage I have is that I am quite conscious of my ignorance, whereas they are not. The arrogance of thinking you know everything is called double ignorance in the Socratic sense. And here, Socrates, here Lao Tzu puts it this way, not knowing is true knowledge. Again, emptying yourself out of false opinions, of a lot of clutter, being open, that's real wisdom. Presuming to know is a disease. Reading a meme or seeing a blog uh, on the internet and then thinking you have it all figured out, <sighs> right? This is really kind of messing up the world right now. Hmm. So that's chapter 71. Going down to chapter 73. The Tao is always at ease. It overcomes without competing, answers without speaking a word, arrives without being summoned, accomplishes without a plan. Its net covers the whole universe and, and though its meshes are wide, it doesn't let a thing slip through. I feel like I'm listening to music when I hear these words. Images, analogies, suggestions, again, provocations. I keep going back to that word. So potent, so pregnant with meaning. And yet if you ask me what they mean, um, when I got done talking, you would be even stupider than we currently are. <laughs> like, like, as he says, the more you know, the less you understand. Those who know don't talk, and those who talk don't know. Boy, are we just running into that again and again and again in these passages. Chapter 74, if you realize that all things change, there is nothing you will try to hold on to. If you aren't afraid of dying, there is nothing you can't achieve. Trying to control the future is like trying to take the master carpenter's place. When you handle the master carpenter's tools, chances are you'll cut yourself. <laughs> yeah, there's, there's a, what Marcus Aurelius the Stoic calls the logos, you know, the will of nature. Sometimes he calls it fate. Sometimes he calls it the gods. There's something in charge here, let's call it the force. Or if you're a theist, if you're a Christian, if you're a Muslim, if you're a Jew, then, then you would call it God and the will of God and fate and all of that kind of thing. You know, God's grace, Holy Spirit, Christians might say. So something that we are to surrender to 
And the word Islam means the peace that comes with submission. And Muslim means one who submits. And so built into the, into the Abrahamic faiths, all three of them, is this idea that real wisdom is knowing where, where my powers end and where the power begins, the higher power. And if you're atheist or you're really, you know, not having this God stuff, that's, that's fine. One could be atheist and be and still derive great use out of the Tao Te Ching because it's not a theistic text. It's not asking for your belief or fealty to a particular theology or a particular deity. I think that's what makes Taoism so appealing to a wide spectrum of people across all of the different religious uh, perspectives. Let me jump to chapter 76. Men are born soft and supple. Dead, they are stiff and hard. Plants are born tender and pliant. Dead, they are brittle and dry. Thus, whoever is stiff and flexible is a disciple of death. Whoever is soft and yielding is a disciple of life. The hard and stiff will be broken. The soft and supple will prevail. Again, think about water. If I try to make a hole in this water, I put my finger in it and there's a hole in the water. But as soon as I pull my finger out, the hole fills in. The water did nothing and yet nothing was left undone. It didn't resist me. It yielded to me. And yet as soon as I pulled my finger out without effort, it erased my presence. It won and it didn't do anything. That's interesting. <laughs> that's, it. that's an interesting message for me to carry into my own struggles to become more effective as a teacher, as a, as a, as a family member, as a, as a husband, as a, as a friend, as a writer, as a, you know, all the things I try to do as a musician, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. All the things I try to conquer and achieve. All that yanging, you know, maybe I need to yin a little bit more. Maybe I need to be a little bit softer. You know, there, in, in different translations of the Tao Te Ching, there are lines that go, that have these passages, something like this, that the, the blade of grass is mightier than the oak tree. Because when the wind comes, the blade of grass is supple. It just, it just bends and lets the wind pass. And it isn't harmed. Whereas the oak tree, you know, yang, very stiff, the, the wind gets really, it just, it just falls over dead. Flexibility is stronger than rigidity in a simple formula. Let me go to uh, chapter 78 here. I just got a couple more to do with you today. A couple more chapters to read into the record. Chapter 78. Nothing in the world is, is as soft and yielding as water. Yet for dissolving the hard and inflexible, nothing can surpass it. An echo of an earlier chapter there. The soft overcomes the hard. The gentle overcomes the rigid. Everyone knows this is true, but few can put it into practice. Therefore, the master remains serene in the midst of sorrow. Evil cannot enter his heart because he has given up helping he, he is people's greatest helper. Again, by not trying, you achieve more. And then Lao Tzu closes chapter 78 with four words that sort of sum up the whole book. True words seem paradoxical. <laughs> Can I get an amen? Chapter 79. Failure is an opportunity. If you blame someone else, there is no end to the blame. Therefore, the master fulfills her own obligations and corrects her own mistakes. She does what she needs to do and demands nothing of others. Have you not experienced failure as an opportunity? Of course you have. And so have I. Again, the Stoics talk quite a bit about that. Chapter 81, the last chapter in the book. Let's see how he wraps it up. True words aren't eloquent. Eloquent words 
aren't true. Wise men don't need to prove their point. Men who need to prove their point aren't wise. <sighs> I need to breathe into that one. He goes on. The master has no possessions. The more he does for others, the happier he is. The more he gives to others, the wealthier he is. The Tao nourishes by not forcing, by not dominating. The master leads. So we have in our hand here in this Tao Te Ching a book of remarkable power, a book of startling brevity, and a book of uncompromising honesty. And yet you feel his struggle, you feel Lao Tzu's struggle as he tries to, as Alan Watts would put it, F the ineffable, <laughs> to, to try to say what just can't be said. But hey, we're poets, we gotta try anyway. We gotta talk about the things which cannot be talked about. It's what humans do. We turn that which cannot be thought about into thoughts, and we turn the thoughts about things that cannot be thought about into words. And then we write books. <laughs> and that's what you have in your hand when you hold a copy of the Tao Te Ching. This isn't gonna answer all your questions, but it's gonna open your mind and your heart to possibilities that you had not heretofore imagined. And it's gonna give you new eyes with which to see your problems and your opportunities, things you may have missed because you were busy looking over here and you forgot about how stillness brings us to something so rich, so deep, so infinite. You know, the great romantic poets, Byrits, Byron, Keats, Shelley, Wordsworth, all those folks, I think it was Wordsworth who wrote about idleness, that giving over time to idleness, to doing nothing, to have those pauses, you know, like Mozart said, it, the music really, to paraphrase, the music isn't in the notes. The music is in the silence between the notes. And do we leave enough silence between the notes in the, of the music of our lives? And I wanna share with you one chapter again. I wanna go back, just, just if you'll indulge me, chapter 67, because I feel like this is such a great way to sum up the power of the Tao Te Ching. We already did this one, but let's do it again. Maybe it'll ring differently in your ears now. Chapter 67, some say that my teaching is nonsense. Others call it lofty, but impractical. But to those who have looked inside themselves, this nonsense makes perfect sense. And to those who put it into practice, this loftiness has roots that go deep. I have just three things to teach, he says. Simplicity, patience, and compassion. Simple in action and in thoughts, you return to the source of being. Patient with both friends and enemies, you accord with the way things are. Compassionate towards yourself, you reconcile all beings in the world. I hope you've enjoyed our journey through the Stephen Mitchell translation here in the HarperCollins edition of the Tao Te Ching. Pick up your copy, you can find them at used outlets online for three, four, five bucks. Uh, you'll never believe that something so magical, something so priceless could be so affordable. <laughs> So enjoy your continuing study of the Tao Te Ching. And I'm just full of gratitude for you even coming by here and spending this time with me today. Thank you.